Sounds good. I have an opportunity to, to speak with Jordan again today about uh, uh, his thoughts and feelings on a particular subject, but did, did you just hear what was read about this situation that we have called human existence? And what happens when you have uh, a situation where you're coming to God and you're asking God for forgiveness for what you may think that God has against you, um, but then I also I'm wondering if you would open your Bibles again to that Micah passage, because these two passages uh, link up together. And then if you stick a third finger in the book of Jonah, and you're going to say, "Oh my goodness, how do you weave all of these together?" But we're going to we're going to do our best. So. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jordan Thornburg. Many of you have known him since he was a toddler and coming up for children's stories, but he's all grown up now. So, yes, indeed. We're going to sit up here and we're going to enjoy uh, talking. First of all, uh, Jordan is going to tell you a few stories about little interactions that he has had with people that have frustrated him. They're like parables, but much less useful. So, um, <laughs> we were talking about patience and how you interact with the people you run into. And one thing that I recognize categorically I'm bad at is um, being a good person on the road. I'm like, I'm a pretty even keel person, but uh, the story that we were talking about that I was instructed to tell verbatim was um, I was going back up to my house and driving past uh, this one particular stretch of the neighborhood, there was a lady out on her front yard and I was driving by not going very fast. It was a good sunny winter day. I was bumping some heritage singers. It was all good. And all of a sudden I noticed this lady and she's doing this whole slow down. She's yelling at the top of her lungs as I'm driving by. The arms are flapping like bootleg air traffic controller kind of thing. So I look down at my speedometer and I'm going 28, 29. And I thought, okay, 25. I could slow it down a little bit, but like that's a little much. So I kid you not, two days later, I'm driving down the same stretch of road, and presumably her husband, miracle she found somebody, um, she, he's sitting there in the front yard, and I'm cruising along, and he starts doing the same thing, slow down, he's looking me dead in the eye, and I look down, I don't adjust any pressure in my gas pedal foot, 27 miles per hour. I said, that's too much. That's, your reaction is so so off scale for this, you know, infraction that's being committed. So, you know, I think the Bible says something about when you run into these kinds of situations of people, you just kind of shake the dust off your sandals. I'm not that good, man. I every, for like the next bit when I drove past that house, I would get within about 200 yards and I'd slow down to five miles per hour and I would just creep past the house and I'd make like unbreaking eye contact, hoping that somebody would be out in the front yard. And I did this for like I think it was around on the month mark, and I realized, nobody cares. I'm doing this to myself. I'm making myself late to get home. This is like feeding some perverse little petty demon inside me. I should let this go. I should be bigger than that. And then on the day that I'm thinking that, I'm heading back home, and I turn on the neighborhood street, and there's this car right behind me, practically in the back seat with me in my car. And I look in the rearview mirror, and who is it? It's the couple. Oh, man. So I, instead of just waiting until I got all the way up to the house, I screwed it back to five miles per hour right there at the bottom of the hill. And I was cruising, and they were doing their hand gestures. What's this guy doing? I was so happy. <laughs> and so instead of shaking the dust off my sandals, I picked up my sandals and right in their face. <laughs> so that was obviously not the right call. Um, that's pettier than I should probably be. That was not making amends with these people. I still haven't gone back with like a fruit basket and left it on their driveway, so I'm probably still like in contempt somewhere. Um, but the point of that is, you know, we're going to get up here and talk to you, and at some point, he and I are going to make a statement saying, this is what God tells you to do. And so I want you to know that I'm not uh, coming from a place of great personal authority. I'm, you know, uh, still learning it as we go as well. But, um, you know, we were talking about how... It's kind of easy to dehumanize people that you run into at certain points when you only have that small interaction. I know nothing about these people in my neighborhood. I don't know if their kid almost got hit by a car walking out in the street. I don't know what their month has been like. I don't know what kind of stresses they have. 
Um, I caught them in a moment where I was in a certain mindset and they were in a certain mindset and it just so happened to create this little petty tableau uh, that I lived out for a month. And, um, and so, you know, God calls us to do a little better mm-hmm. and to sort of look at people more full spectrum. Well, he's, Matthew 18, many of us know this chapter because of uh, what it enjoins that we should do if someone has some problem with us. And uh, many of us are familiar with the, the four-step process, right? Uh, if, if something's going wrong, actually, I think the first bit we kind of don't read carefully enough. Uh, actually, if someone else has a problem with you, is how the Bible reads. So if, if you didn't catch that, just understand that, that Jesus... Jesus isn't holding back here in Matthew. Uh, he is, is saying, this doesn't look like your problem. It looks like their problem, but you're going to go to them anyway. It's kind of interesting that that's how it begins. And it says, you're going to go to them and you're going to tell them about the situation, at least from your perspective, and see whether or not they agree. Step two, they didn't agree. So you're going to go get someone else, uh, one or two people, and you're going to go. And, and so it progresses until when I was younger, uh, I kind of felt like what was being said was treat them as a pagan, as an unbeliever. And when I was young, I don't know about whether you were young, but that meant you kicked them out of the church. Am I right? Well, it was uh, Eugene Peterson, uh, a great scholar, Canadian, uh, just passed away last year, who rewrote the entire Bible in his own words. Uh, How many of you know about the Clear Word Bible? That gentleman, Jack Blanco, Dr. Jack Blanco, a good Adventist uh, immigrant from Germany, he did the same thing. It's called the Clear Word Bible. So if you have heard of The Message, Peterson, Clear Word Bible, Jack Blanco, these are exercises in spirituality that they have shared with us. It was Peterson's version that changed my heart. It says, treat them like someone who needs a gospel presentation. Isn't that what we should be offering pagans? Isn't that what we should be offering unbelievers? It, t- it totally changed my attitude. Here, Jordan's giving you, giving you a great example of, of a situation where, like he said, he didn't know where they were coming from, they didn't know where he was coming from, and uh, here comes Matthew 18 saying, you would like to be forgiven by your heavenly Father for the things that you actually know about, You don't even know all the things that you probably should be forgiven for, but you'd like to be forgiven for the the bad things that you have done that you know about, and you are at the altar, and you have your sacrifice, and, 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 and you're about to pray, and God reminds you, there are these people in your neighborhood. They need a fruit basket. They need a fruit basket. The the Matthew instructs us to leave that situation with God, he's going to be there. He says, don't worry about me. Leave that situation and go and make things right. By the way, that four-step process, I have now come to understand more in terms of a fireman or a rescue person. You're out there trying to rescue that relationship And if you can't do it with your own strength, you gather other people around you until you have, if necessary, gathered the entire church, the Bible says. Are you hearing the the heart of God in this? Are you hearing how he is saying, do not hold back on trying to save the relationship that you should have with this person. Please involve everybody in trying to save this person into the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but that's just amazing. And 
I, I, I am also intrigued, and that's why we put this text in here for you today, about the fact that, that God has this attitude towards people of love. And he's trying to have us have that same attitude towards people. But uh, you, you heard him mention Jonah a little earlier, and I, I mentioned it off-key at one of our meetings, and I feel like my brain was kind of leaving the station with, without me, but fortunately, Captain MDiv here brought it back in the line. <laughs> so, um, one it, was, thing, it, was a good, it was a good jaunt. One thing that Jonah does is kind of illustrates these axes of interaction that we were talking about, yep. because you have these relationships um, at a horizontal level with the people around you, interactions the human interactions that you have um, and so these are the ones that you deal with on a, on a day-to-day basis but you have the vertical axis which is your relationship with God and um, as relationships they're subject to their own frustrations and, and um, kind of missteps so you have people who frustrate you or you might step on somebody's toes um, you might be missing the mark with God, and sometimes you might feel that he's not, you know, living up to some expectation for you. And Jonah um, does kind of a good job because I, I'm not proud to admit, but I think I mentioned that at the last time we hung out, we were talking about drivers and what you do with that kind of anger. And if some angel descended and said, be ye not afraid, at 12.30 on Tuesday morning, every driver who's ever wronged you is going to get into a massive pileup on the 405, I'd be on the overpass with like popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's it's that's probably a little dramatic but you know it's it's easy to sort of fall into that Jonah mindset where you're under your shady tree and you're waiting for the light show to happen on Nineveh because you know these people have obviously you know disappointed God in some way allegedly and and you've been sent to tell them so. right and, uh, and sent to, sent to say what God told you to say which is repent which is turn around, have a different relationship with God, or else, okay? And, 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 and I don't know about you, but my growing up in the Adventist church, we, we have a particular message that is very much like the Jonah message, in the sense that we are saying to people, uh, there's, there are three angels that are flying in the midst of heaven in, in Revelation 14, 7, and, and one of them is, is pretty categoric about the fact that you know, if you don't turn around and have a different relationship with God, you're going to be part of a people who are going to be disconnected from God permanently. And so, you know, you may not want to be part of those people. And so we have this message we're trying to give to people. And in the process, I think God is, is teaching us how he would like us to do that. And he teaches us, I believe, in, in the relationships that we have with each other. So could it be that when we you know, get all schmaltzy and sing that song, we are his hands, we... Really? When are you going to allow someone else to be the hands and feet of Jesus in your life? Did you think that that was only a one-way street? In life, we have relationships, and there are two ways. Could it be that God wants to teach us something about himself through someone else and their actions in our lives? I don't know if you learned anything from the people who were trying to get you to slow down, except maybe that you did for a month. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they did win that kind of uh, philosophical point. I, you know, there is an object lesson, I think, um, one thing that we come back to a lot when we talk is self-reflection, introspection, mm -hmm. um, what you do with the experiences you have and how you carry them with you. Um, so that was kind of a, a wake-up call for me where you know, I realized uh, there was a day where somebody cut me off and it's tempting to want to speed up and you know, give them a look. But then you wonder, like, what happens if I pull up and it's somebody I know? What if it's one of you guys? And I'm sitting there, you know, mm. that's like going to make it kind of a little awkward next time we run into each other. It's like, mm. that, that, that's why Gene drives a big truck. Exactly. He's up high. He I, can't see in my it. tiny Acura, I know better no, not to pick a no. fight with a, with a Chevy. Um, but, you know, you, you, have to, you have to bring it back and, and realize that, you know, in the same way that you'd hope you're looked at as a complete person with nuance and 
you know, affected by your circumstances. It's the same thing for, for people. Um, and so the object lesson, if there was one there, is, is that um, maybe grow up a little bit, you know, in, in the little moments and sort of uh, practice, practice a more Christ-like way of looking at the people around you. Agreed. I mean, he's, he's already referred to the end of the book of Jonah, but let's remember the beginning of the book of Jonah. Jonah doesn't want to go. No. Jo- Jonah doesn't want to have this interaction with these people. And, and this is what I, I, I guess I went all MDiv on him. Uh, <laughs> the fact is that, that Jonah has been sent on previous missions by God. And he's been sent to say these very same things to other people. And God has not burnt them up. Okay? So, you know, when, when you are mad, when you're upset, and you're thinking you have the right to be this way with other people, um, remember the first part of the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is picked again. And if, if, if you have been here several weeks, maybe you will know that when I pray on Sabbath morning, I'm praying prayers of asking forgiveness from God for all of us where we have acted in certain ways that have not well represented his kingdom. And here we are, people who have chosen to be called Christians. And maybe the things that we have done, maybe the things that we have said, have not represented the kingdom of God very well. So here goes Jonah. He's, he's now turned that around. And he's actually pointing a finger at God and saying, you know, God, uh, as one of your representatives, I don't feel like you've held up your end of the bargain. I don't know if you've ever had those kind of feelings. Maybe you felt that you didn't have the right to talk to God that way. Well, maybe that's because you haven't read the Psalms recently. And maybe you haven't heard David remonstrating with God. God! I've done all this for you. Why haven't you done this and this and this for me? Jonah gets on that ship that is not going anywhere near his supposed destination. It's going literally the opposite direction. So we have got to know that he is completely not wanting to follow God's instruction, and yet he knows as we said in the children's story, this is a big God that he is serving and he thinks that he can run away, but he really knows in the bottom of his heart that he can't. And, and how do we know that he feels this way? Is because when the, when the seas get rough and he knows that the boat is going down and that he is the problem on the boat, he says, look guys, I'm the problem on the boat. It's because of me the, this big God that I serve, uh, he's, he's upset with me. Just throw me overboard. Sacrifice me. Adventist, have you ever, have you ever said, sacrifice me? <laughs> have you ever, have you ever told God, what my fellow pastor, I'll leave his name out for this moment, has said to me, and that is, if the Catholics aren't going to heaven, I don't want to go to heaven either. Hmm. That's really weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's really weird, but that is what we're talking about today, is that God has an attitude towards everybody, including us, that he would like us to have towards our fellow human beings. Jordan's already said it. The vertical axis needs to have an effect on the horizontal axis. And it can be real easy to get grace uh, skewed when you're kind of lost in the in the everyday, because I think we all recognize that we need grace and we need patience from God. There's no, there's no forward motion without that element. Um, but it's almost a different set of rules for you know the people that you walk around with, because you know sometimes it's hard to see the divinity. It's hard to see the divinity in, in you know myself 
some days. Mm -hmm. So you feel like there's a different, um, a different dynamic. But, you know, both... Sort of different rules apply. Right. But, you know, the, the one should inform the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that I have to force myself to be mindful of is if I'm going to go and ask God for grace, I better be willing to extend that to the people around me. Um, and it's, it, you know, sometimes that's easy. It, sometimes that's harder. Um, but well, I think, it's hard for Jonah. Sure. Yeah, and that's... God that's, had been extending grace, extending grace, extending grace, and he was getting upset with God for extending grace. Right. Wow. Uh, are we ever guilty of that? I don't know. Oh, sure. And, and you know, in hindsight, if you time traveled back to, you know, Jonah and said, hey, dude, like, this is, this is your book, and you spelled it all out as clearly as we have it spelled out, he'd probably say, ooh, no, that's like, that's not... Not at all how I want to be, not at all how I want to come across, but, you know, I don't always have a good, uh, consistent perspective check outside myself. And so if you go long enough, it can only be after, like, a losing streak, you'd be like, oh, man, that's not really me, that's not, mm -hmm. that's not my best, you know, my best month or so. Um, and if you are able to extend that kind of awareness to yourself, you know, there should be something where if, uh, you know... If you spill coffee on my shirt, uh, shame on you for drinking coffee in the first place. But if you spill coffee on my shirt, then uh, as I'm getting mad, I should I should have that moment where it's like you know, okay, is this one thing I talked about with the kids that I work with? Is this a big problem or is this a small problem? And you know, I, I sound so self righteous when I talk. Though I sit them down, I say, now tell me, is this a big problem? They say, no. I said, that's right, it's a small problem. And here I am, you know, letting these small problems get under my skin because it's a lot easier to give that advice than it is to sort of take it. Um, but, you know, I, I work to try and temper my initial reaction with that sense where it's like, okay, if I'm going to be asking God to forgive me, like when I'm tucking myself in at night, say, you know, let's make this right, you gotta, you got to put the same amount of effort in with the people that you, that you interact with. Mm -hmm. um, I find God brings, brings people to mind, uh, and, and maybe that's what he's talking about here in Matthew 18. He's, there are people that are going to come to your mind, there are interactions that are going to come to your mind, and you're going to say, I, I need to make amends, I, I, I need, need, to, need to make that right. I've used in the, in the worship card, you will see the word conciliation, and I, I've, I made a, a quick leap, Eric, you can help me if I'm wrong, um, reconciliation. We talk about that word, don't we? Okay, so that's just got the little prefix R-E on the front of the word conciliation. So I, I kind of figure that maybe conciliation is that thing that we should be in all the time, this, this idea of being in a conciliatory, in a maybe a 360 view of ourselves, uh, you know, that, that we have the opportunity, as you were saying, to, to just kind of check um, how, how's it going? Uh, what are our relationships like? Um, we, uh, we don't want to be too prescriptive this morning, uh, but we, we brought you to three different scriptures today, Matthew, uh, Micah. Uh, God talks in Micah again about beating your, plow, your, your, your swords into plowshares. We often think of this on a global term. Uh, some of my friends in my park, they have a they have a, a little monument to this text, and, and, and it really comes from the 60s a lot when they were thinking of global disarmament, and that you can think of that. But what, what if we were to take it personally this morning and say, we are going to decide that instead of carrying swords to do business with, we're going to till the soil of relationship instead, uh, and... and Figure, figure things out a different way, maybe figure things out from, from God's perspective. Because um, he certainly has been really, really generous with me. Yeah. I know that, that uh, uh, there's, there's times when uh, I have thought that God was not doing all that he should be doing for me, or that he was not telling me what was coming next. Okay, I don't know if you've had that feeling. Uh, the Lord's Prayer has been very helpful. That piece that says, 
that he will give us our, our weekly bread, right? Or was it monthly? <laughs> it's daily bread. He's not going to tell us what's happening tomorrow. And in fact, he tells us, don't even worry about tomorrow because today's going to have enough troubles. Right? Today's going to have enough relational issues that you don't need to think about. What... Now, we, we, we all know that we would like to be better people. So thanks for coming today. Thanks for believing that coming to church, uh, as I was talking to, to Joe uh, about Frank this morning, thanks for coming and believing that getting together like this is supportive it's supportive to your relationship, your vertical relationship, allowing us, thank you, uh, Richard, for letting us shake hands today, uh, allowing us to be supportive of each other. That's, to me, one of the biggest reasons why we should come to church. Amen. Have you thought about that? Not only to make things right, if that's what's necessary, but to be supportive of having that attitude in our community because as the Bible was saying to us, thank you, Denise, for reading this, we need to be trusting in God and having Him be the lamp and light in our lives. Maybe that was the hymn we just sung. The Bible will show us what it is that God wants us to do. Jesus Himself said, I do nothing except the Father tells me. This week, this week as we go forward, um, prescription. What, what, what did we say? We wanted to. Oh, do it's going to sound things. much better coming from you. You have oh, much no. more. Oh no! Oh <laughs> no! Um, you know, we talked. We talked about mindfulness, and we talked about really uh, putting forth a consistent effort to um, take stock of of the things that are going on around you, um, and not to be you know, too minimizing on your own stresses because I, I don't think God calls you to just sweep it under the rug. That's how you build up that blood pressure that'll make your head explode. But, you know, you can be honest and, and come to God and say, look, man, I'm really bent out of shape about all these little things that keep happening. And that frustration is real and it's hard to shake and get rid of. Um, and you can take that to him. Uh, but just to be mindful of, of the fact that everybody's got a score like that that they're sort of keeping track of um, and to recognize that the circumstances that the people were called to love their circumstances might be affecting who they are in a way that you have to kind of account for um, and we also talked about perspective taking which is another thing I do with a lot of my kids is you know if sister comes up and steals the toy and you know runs back off to the other room and he goes over there and cracks her over the head. It's like, okay, let's talk about this. How are you going to feel if she clocks you in the back of the dome? And he's like, well, I probably wouldn't feel too good. So, you know, that's, that's something functionally that we can do still ongoing as a process is sort of put yourself in somebody else's spot. And it sounds really easy and cliche, but, you know, you learn a lot by trying to imagine what somebody else's you know, shoes are like to walk around in, and it might make you more gracious in the, in the long run. Yep. I'm still beta testing that. I'll let you know how it's going. <laughs> Anyone else want to commit this week to beta testing, uh, being mindful uh, of your, your own situation, kind of doing a 360, and then also uh, practicing grace, practicing the, the, the art of, of grace, which God does with us every day as we represent him. And then uh, we, he would like us to be his representatives, kind of like Jonah, uh, and do what he wants us to do. But I'm sure he's hoping that we won't feel like Jonah at the end. And the, okay. last, the last thing that I do remember, because there was a backside to this There was a backside point, to that piece of paper, uh, yes, sir. two seconds we got left. But um, one thing that I have to remind myself is that it's an ongoing thing. It's mm -hmm. not something mm -hmm. that you, you reach enlightenment on one day and then you're good to go for the rest of ever. Right. Um, I have to ask God regularly for the, for the strength and consistency to keep practicing that mindfulness because, you know, it's, it's, um, your energy isn't always the same from day to day. No. Or at least mine's not. You may all be superheroes. This could be just silly coming from me. But... Uh, 
you know, for me, it's, it's helpful to remember that this is a process and you get a chance every day to do it a little better than you did before. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's your chance of success is a little better the more you make God a part of that process in my limited experience. So, I, I think that, that as we move forward, we have the opportunity to show God's grace to us by how gracious we are to other people. Um, uh, again, I'm, th I'm trying to school myself in thinking about being on God's team. I know that that may be somewhat of a foreign concept to you, but some of you are thinking about sins, okay? Um, please, maybe we need to think more about the fact that we're on God's team and that sometimes we represent well and sometimes we don't. And the graciousness of God towards us is that even when we don't, he still is willing to deploy us. He's still willing to let us go out there and represent him, to be his hands and be his feet, to be his words to someone else. Uh, I don't know if you have had the opportunity recently, but, but I had the opportunity this week to hear from a friend whom I had used Messenger to contact in England and had not heard from. And she called, well, she texted me back this week and she said, you, you will never know how much it meant for me, for you to contact me at that moment. Because all I said was, you know what, I just, I just have this feeling that I need to talk to you. Why, I just said, why is that? Question mark. She was taking voluntary firing. She was quitting her job voluntarily at that moment. And it meant a whole lot to her to know that there's a God in heaven who told me to text her. See what I'm saying? Okay, if you are on God's errands this week, if you are uh, doing this because you want to be his hands and feet, then when he says text this person or call this person or say this to this person, just know that that's the Holy Spirit and just go with it. Just go with it. Uh, because who knows, maybe you'll end up receiving texts at the very moment or a phone call or whatever from someone else who's part of this support group or, or part of your, your wider schedule. Because guess what? Just as I told the kids, we serve a big God. We serve a God who knows everything about each and every one of us and he still loves us. Just like he loved the 250,000 people and animals, did you read that in Jonah? And animals that he didn't want to kill. And Jonah's like, really? My reputation's on the line here, God. <laughs> can you imagine wanting people to die just so that you can look like a good prophet? Like I said, I like what my friend said. If the Catholics aren't going to heaven, maybe I don't want to be with that kind of God. But good news, he wants everybody. Amen. He loves everybody and he wants everybody to come home with him. And we have the opportunity to, to tell somebody that this week. Jesus loves you, died to save you, and he's coming back to get you real quick. What do you say? What a message. I mean, if, if, you, if you have problems sharing that message, you might just want to ask God for courage. You know, you might just want to ask him for a little courage to, to share this wonderful, wonderful message in the midst of this crazy, crazy world where people are dying right now. They are dying because they love Jesus and somebody else doesn't like that. And if you're worried about that, if you're fearful about that, please just ask God for courage this week to be this kind of a representative, to be this kind of a person that we have talked about today. The book of Jonah, we said, doesn't seem to have an ending. And like uh, Jordan said, if we had to ask Jonah now, if we could time travel back there and say, hey, is this really how it ended? You just left Nineveh from the top of that hill. You just went home, caught a ship home, whatever. I, I, I guess I'm going to need to get to heaven, get to the other side to ask Jonah that question. What happened, man? I mean, you, you were not being very nice to the... 
And Jonah's going to have the opportunity, I pray, to say, you know what, that's, that's not really how I felt. Um, that or you rolled around the town for the next three months and just set trash can fires out of spite. <laughs> Which is... I, I don't know about you, but this is, this is why I love Jordan and, 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 and love, love the perspective, and I'm very thankful for it. Hey, listen, as you leave today, you have another opportunity to, uh, to help a life that may be uh, far across salt water. Uh, see Frank about that outside. And um, God bless you all in your situations uh, with yourselves and also with your friends and family. Amen.